It was a very exciting day yesterday. I think I really enjoyed a lot of what I was hearing about values-driven innovation and things like that because I work at a place where values are basically everything. <laughs> so at CERN, uh, everyone there, I don't know if you know this, but you're not going to get rich by discovering the Higgs boson. Uh, when we discover dark matter, you're not going to be able to make dark buildings out of it. Everybody at CERN is there because we're passionate about what we do. Full stop. And in fact, we're not going to get rich even doing our research. You know, you spend, people, people that I know spend the bulk of their, you know, most productive years working for peanuts, relative peanuts, because they really care about human, human curiosity and humans exploring the very edges of our human knowledge. Which is a bit redundant, but there we go. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. Um, but yeah, so um, I want to actually switch gears a little bit and just maybe start my little thing here. Yeah. So again, my name is James, and I'm a particle physicist at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Um, and I'm talking today, though, about not necessarily the thing that I started out with, but instead I'm talking about black holes. Because at first, you wouldn't notice anything. And then, suddenly, everything would change radically and violently. Imagine yourself 500 years in the future. You're sitting in a ship, zipping through the silent, empty void of outer space. You're traveling to explore a black hole up close for the first time in human history. You're very lucky to be able to do this. For centuries, the prospect of traveling to a black hole was absurd. The closest one is nearly 60 million billion kilometers away. But great advancements were made in space travel and cryogenics, and here you are. You're traveling to explore a black hole. And you're about to make a very big mistake. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. What is a black hole? Everyone here is either sitting down or standing. That might not sound like a profound statement, but cosmically, it kind of is. And in moments like this in our society of extreme stress and hardship and war and crypto scams, um, it's important to keep in mind, no matter who you are, no matter your gender or skin color, you all have one very important thing in common. You're not currently floating around the room. Why are you not floating? Because of gravity, of course. Gravity is the force of attraction between any two large objects, like between the, the moon and the earth, or between the earth and you. But gravity is not just any old force. Gravity does what it does because the presence of a large amount of stuff within a volume of space creates a kind of sinkhole in space itself. But wait a minute. Stop right there. What does it mean that gravity creates a sinkhole in space? Space is just space, right? Empty, a void, nothing, the absence of something, not something itself, right? It turns out that that's not actually true. For example, space actually has properties that we can understand in a sense that it has substance. Not, it's not stuff, but it actually has a kind of substance to it. So we ask this question, what is space? For example, when an apple falls from a tree, what is it falling through? Well, the atmosphere, sure. What about the moon? As the moon orbits the Earth, what is the moon falling through? There's no atmosphere, so it's falling through space. Nothing, right? But again, what is space? For the longest time, People thought about space as this kind of background abstract thing, right? It's sort of the chalkboard upon which you would draw a big circle to, for example, represent a planet or something. But you don't think of the chalkboard as being something real on the same footing as the planet, right? It's just the background. It's kind of the emptiness of the void upon which you place ideas to then make sense of them, right? So it's just basically nothing. Turns out this is wrong. It turns out the more stuff you pack into a given volume, space starts to flow and bend. So imagine if you, the more chalk you applied to the chalkboard, the chalkboard itself would start to bend and, get, and turn into a, have a little bit of a divot in it. And this has been proven to be true over and over and over again. 
we know for a fact that this is the way space behaves. It's not just nothing. It actually has substance to it. Imagine what it must have been to be one of the people that came up with this idea. The people that came up with this idea, they were not thinking incrementally. They were not thinking superficially. They had to dig deep, very deep. They had to question the fundamentals. And with great success, because like I said, it's been proven to be true over and over again, space can actually bend and flow. And the more stuff that you pack into a given volume, the more space will bend and flow until eventually, if you pack too much stuff into a fixed volume, space will be flowing into the center of the black hole, uh, to the space faster than you could ever possibly travel. And this is a black hole. There we go. You can think of a black hole in space like an extremely strong water drain where the water is the fabric of space itself. Imagine you're a fish in the water. If you get too close to the drain, no, the water will be flowing inward faster than you could possibly swim. And even if you swim at your fastest possible speed, you'll be sucked into the drain. Likewise, if you stay far enough away from a black hole in space, you're okay. But there's a point of no return called the event horizon beyond which space is flowing into the center faster than the speed of light. Forget about your spaceship, not even light can escape from inside of a black hole. And unlike a fish in a water drain, if a fish got too close to a black hole in space, the gravitational force on its back fins and its head would be so different that it would probably be stretched into something resembling fish spaghetti. So because black holes, not even light can escape from in black, inside black holes, we can't see them directly, but we can see stars orbiting completely empty spots in space. And as of just a few years ago, we can see the hot gas swirling around black holes in images like this one from ju released just a few months ago of the black hole at the center of our galaxy. This is the cosmic vortex that holds our Milky Way together. And are we still? Ah, good. And black holes are everywhere. The universe loves these twisted vortices. There's a huge one at the center of nearly every big galaxy we've observed, including, as mentioned, our own Milky Way. And in fact, black holes are scattered around and throughout our galaxy as well. The closest known confirmed black hole is about 6,000 light years away. Cosmically, that's not that far. And in fact, there could be a mysterious black hole even shockingly closer to Earth. In the outer edges of our solar system, several big rocks seem to be orbiting in strange ways. Some astronomers think there's a new planet, Planet Nine, that could be responsible for these odd wobbling orbits. But we see no evidence of a visible planet. So what if the reason we haven't seen it is that it's not a planet, but a black hole about the size of an apple that was formed not long after the Big Bang and then floated around our galaxy for billions of years before eventually getting stuck in our solar system. So an apple-sized black hole, catch. Could you make a black hole yourself? If you want to know the density it takes to make a black hole, you simply take your textbook on gravity. I assume you all have a textbook on gravity on your bedside table like I do. And you find the black hole equation. It'll tell you, for some given amount of mass, the size of a volume you have to pack it in to make a black hole. For example, to make a black hole out of the Earth, you'd need to pack the entire thing into a volume about the size of a blueberry. Most black holes we know of are much larger than apples and blueberries, of course. The one at the center of our galaxy has a volume that uh, has a diameter equivalent to about one-third of the distance between the Earth and the Sun, but with a, volume of, with a mass that's, ten, I think, 10 million times that of the Sun. And there are much larger black holes in other galaxies, ones that have masses tens of billions of times that of the Sun, and the, the volumes that could encompass our entire solar system. So how, does, how do black holes come into existence? 
How does the universe make something so dense that it nearly punctures the fabric of space-time? Well, one way is when an enormous star dies. After billions of years, a star can exhaust the fuel it needs to burn, and in one final hurrah, explode. Let's see if my explosion, there we go. And with no nuclear fusion to push it outward, gravity wins, and the whole thing collapses in on itself. And this collapse can be so severe that it creates a black hole. So you can see you need a pretty violent event to make a black hole, like an enormous star exploding and collapsing. So is it possible that we could make black holes where I work at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN? The Large Hadron Collider is a 27-kilometer circular tunnel on the border of France and Switzerland, about 100 meters underground, where we smash together protons at very high speeds and energies. At the smallest possible scale, this is a pretty violent event. And it's theoretically possible we could make tiny modified versions of black holes, miniature black holes, that would evaporate immediately. This would be phenomenal, despite the looks on some of your faces, because the real reason we physicists are obsessed with black holes is that they could help us answer one of the most baffling and long-standing mysteries of science, the mystery of how gravity and quantum mechanics work together. In physics, we have two fantastically good theoretical models that have withstood essentially all of our experimental tests. The first is called general relativity, which describes how gravity works on very large scales. The other is called quantum mechanics, which governs the world of the very small. Each of these by itself ranks among the most impressive intellectual achievements of humankind. But there's a problem. When we try to naively combine these two theories, hoping for a more fundamental theory of everything, everything breaks. We get nonsense answers like infinite energies and probabilities greater than one. When this happens, this is the universe's way of telling us to think harder. We suspect that some kind of quantum gravity must have existed way back at the moment of the Big Bang. And the place in the current universe where these two theories collide is inside of a black hole. So studying a black hole up close, either in the laboratory or in space, would shed monumental light on the subject. Sadly, we have not found any evidence of miniature black holes at the Large Hadron Collider yet. Oh. But maybe we just need a bigger and more energetic collider. <laughs> Discussions are currently underway for the next generation of particle collider, the future circular collider. Presumably, when the future becomes the present, they'll change the name, which would be 100 kilometers around and could reach energy seven times that we currently achieve. But would that be big enough? What if quantum gravity is waiting for us on the moon? I hope the moon's coming up. There we go where the Large Hadron Collider is 27 kilometers around, a circular collider around the moon would be 11,000 kilometers in circumference and could reach energies a thousand times that currently achieved. So let's take stock for a moment. I'm standing in front of you and I'm suggesting we build an enormous superstructure around the moon to make black holes. Is this crazy? It turns out it's not so crazy. So just to, after talking about, <laughs> After talking about this for several years as a kind of just fun, inspirational tool, I actually wrote a paper about this with a colleague not recently, published in a journal here. And it's not crazy. It turns out that it's entirely possible to make a, a black hole, uh, sorry, <laughs> to make a, a, a collider around the moon. It seems like something that's, that's uh, that there are no showstoppers to this. All the technology exists. It's just a matter of development and scale. A circular collider around the moon sometime in the 22nd century might sound impossible, but it's not impossible impossible, it's regular impossible. And regular impossible we can do. Regular impossible is only impossible, as you know, right up until the moment someone makes it possible. But will that be big enough? The larger your collider, the higher your energy, until eventually you reach a kind of ultimate en energy for individual particles, the Planck energy. This is the energy at which gravity and quantum mechanics must have something to do with each other. But by some estimates, to reach the Planck energy in a collider, you would need to build one that's like the Large Hadron Collider that circles around the outer edge of Neptune. 
Clearly, we're no going to need some major innovation to make this happen. And by the time our civilization advances to be able to build a superstructure like this, we'll probably also have mastered interstellar space travel. And at that point, you, 500 years from now, will be traveling to a black hole. One day, in your ship, you get tired. You note that you should arrive at your destination in about 12,000 years. So you decide to take a 12,000 year long nap. And as you lie down on your cryogenic bed, you very slightly bump your ship's accelerator. You don't even notice. After 12,000 years, you awake, fix yourself a cup of coffee, and you notice from your gravitational sensor that something is very wrong. You seem to be too close to the event horizon of your black hole. You open the windows and you look out the window and you see an enormous, profoundly black disk in space. The light from the stars and galaxies behind it twisted and deformed. You stare into the center of this disk, a cosmic eye staring back at you. And it's the emptiest thing you've ever seen. Your jaw drops and your eyes widen and then you realize that, that, that maybe you, 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 you don't know if you're too, too late, if you're, you don't know if you've crossed the event horizon yet. You double check your gravitational sensor and it says that you're not there quite yet. You have five seconds to blast away. You leap from your chair, jumping toward the controls for your rockets, spilling hot coffee all over your hands. You scream and fall to the ground. And by the time you get up, it's too late. You're crossing the event horizon of a black hole. You, st you, st you nearly stop breathing. Your mouth feels like sand and you close your eyes. You can't believe that this could possibly be happening. You open your eyes again and you look out the window and everything looks about the same. The disk is maybe getting a tiny bit larger, but otherwise nothing is different. You, you, you feel the same. You, you think maybe you were wrong and there's still a, a chance that you can get away. You triple check your gravitational sensor and no matter which direction you point it, it says that you are pointing toward the center of a black hole. And then you know for sure you've crossed the event horizon you are inside a black hole? A calm terror settles over you. How did you get in this situation? For a very long time, while you were floating in your space, spaceship, while you were asleep, the conditions of the universe around you were changing very slowly, nearly imperceptibly. And then suddenly, it was too late. Floating in your spaceship inside of a black hole, what do you do? You might start thinking of possible escapes. I mean, maybe all the clever scientists were wrong and there's still a way to escape that hadn't been anticipated. You, you start fantasizing that maybe if you just wait long enough or you just get lucky, eventually you'll pass back over this, this event horizon and could zoom away from the black hole back to the universe you once knew, back to the way things were. And as you're fantasizing, you look down and you see that your feet are drifting away from you and your legs are being stretched into long, thin, spaghetti-like strands and then suddenly your shoes are so far away that you can't see them anymore. And in that split second before you hit the center, you realize two things. One, that no one really knows what happens in the center of a black hole. And two, there is no going back to the way things were. The only way out, if there is a way out, is directly through the black hole. Sometimes reality becomes twisted, seemingly beyond recognition. And right now, as 
the planet burns and the global temperature rises, and as large-scale war waged by a fascist has returned to Europe for almost the first time in 80 years, and as so many of us are dead from a mismanaged pandemic, while so many others allow themselves to be duped by pseudoscience and misinformation, right now you'd be forgiven for thinking that we'd fallen into a societal black hole. In retrospect, it happened so slowly, nearly imperceptibly, while so many of us were asleep. And then it was too late. But just like in a black hole in space, the only way out is through. Our current societal black hole is a golden opportunity to think in radical new ways to construct a better society. But we have to dig deep. We can't think superficially. We can't think incrementally. We have to dig deep, very deep. When you travel to a black hole in space or make one in the laboratory, you can study the very fabric and structure of space and time to understand what leads to these cosmic sinkholes. And right now, we can use this challenging moment to study the very fabric and structure of society to understand what leads to such situations like this. But again, we have to dig deep, very deep. We can't think superficially. And we, have, and we all have this opportunity right now. We can all do this no matter our field or sector. So look closely at your company, your team, your industry, and ask, what are the big questions that drive us? Hopefully this is working. I've lost the uh, thing again here. Ah, what are the big questions that drive us? And what are the motivations behind those questions and how am I, with my work, with my resources, with my life, making the world a better place for others less fortunate? And if I'm not doing that, how can I do so? So thinking about next quarter's profits or next year's big thing is fine, but it limits ourselves. How can you prepare for the next generation or the next century? No, I'm not necessarily suggesting you need to innovate something specific and concrete that will change the world in the 22nd century. But this kind of thinking, thinking beyond ourselves, not just in space, but in time, liberates the mind and can lead you to see your current challenges in a vastly new and innovative way. So what big ideas do we need to question and interrogate to really, truly, substantially innovate in your company or field and create a better world? So back to my personal example. There's more than one reason why we should consider building a particle collider around the moon. <laughs> the first reason is scientific. We would learn immeasurably wonderful things about our universe. But the second reason is existential. Our society is addicted to repeating its mistakes. And right now, we seem to be on the verge of simply giving space, the moon, and Mars to wealthy private individuals and corporations whose only interests are extraction, exploitation, and profit. This is bad because this extractive, exploitative mindset here on Earth has led to the destruction of the environment. If we don't really, really question our fundamentals. And if we don't center projects such as this, so for example, a particle collider around the moon is a project that we, we would mount solely because humans are curious about the universe. And it doesn't have to be this project. It can be other projects like a space telescope or something like this. <coughs> these kinds of projects, if we don't center these projects when we explore space, we'll simply repeat the same mistakes we've made here on Earth. And we'll never, we'll never change our mindset here on Earth and we'll never be able to advance technologically to eventually experience what it's like to explore the vast regions of space, maybe to explore a black hole hundreds of years from now. But we can't stop there. And I'm almost done, I promise. We can't stop there. We have to dig deep. We have to go even farther and question the very fundamentals. So for example, the problem that we're facing right now is not just a few narcissistic billionaires. Why do billionaires even exist to begin with? How did we allow ourselves to develop and maintain systems that result in a few dozen human beings holding as much wealth as billions of the rest of us combined? Unless you think I'm simply a lofty, unrealistic idealist, think about it this way. 
How many possible new clients might your company have if this enormous amount of wealth were more equitably distributed? What innovations are you missing because the potential innovator had the misfortune to be born into poverty and therefore has no chance to join your organization? And if we don't radically rethink the way our current society is organized, we might not exist long enough to think about new clients at all. Dig deeper. Why have we allowed the primary beneficiaries of these exploitative systems to convince us that they're inevitable, like they're laws of physics? Keep in mind, gravity creates black holes, and gravity simply a law of nature. But the social, political, and economic systems that lead to extreme wealth inequality, racist policing, and the climate emergency are not laws of nature. They're human-made, which means they can be human unmade. And we owe it to future humans to finally find the bravery to unmake these structures because of course it won't be you 500 years from now traveling to a black hole. It's up to us to fix our social inequities and it's up to us to make sure that our society isn't crushed into oblivion so that your great, 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 25 greats granddaughter can push forward into the unknown to, push, to, to explore a black hole to better, better understand humanity's place in this vast universe. Thanks.